We're going to get started a little bit early today. Um, people might still be filing in, but um, I'm Amanda Balls. I'm this year's president of the Texas Federalist Society. Um, Federalist Society is a national network comprised of conservative and libertarian scholars, students, attorneys, and judges. And as a student chapter, the Texas Federalist Society strives to promote uh, freedom, federalism, and the rule of law, and we do so through um, facilitating debate and discussion within the law school community. So today, um, we have a, an event sponsored by the Article One Initiative. Um, and the Article One Initiative is an initiative um, of the Federal Society's national office that um, strives to restore Congress to its rightful place in the constitutional order. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce Ashley Trossis, or Ashley states me, Alana Brailler, um, or Rallier, sorry, um, our Vice President of Operations, who's going to introduce our speaker. Hello, I'm excited to introduce Professor David Schoenbrod today. David Schoenbrod is a trustee professor at the New York Law School, and he graduated with his LLB from Yale School of Law. He's also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and he was a senior staff attorney for the Natural Resource Defense Council, where he led the charge to get lead out of gasoline. He is an expert on environmental law, delegation of executive power, and federal regulations, and has authored several books on these topics including most recently DC Confidential, in which he uncovers the structural issues in our government, which allow politicians to promise good news while evading uh, bad results. Please help me in welcoming Professor David Jones. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for to my classmate, uh, Richard Markovitz, uh, for hospitality in Austin. Uh, so I feel very warm and glad to be here. Um, let me start out this way. Let me tell you about an experience I had. It was clear to me 10 years ago that our environmental statutes are badly obsolete. I mean, think about when they were adopted. The Clean Air Act. Was, as we know it today, was adopted in 1970. That's almost half a century ago. Uh, the Clean Water Act, shortly afterwards. Most of the statutes were adopted during the 1970s. The last amendment of the Clean Air Act was in 1990, more than a quarter of a century ago. And almost all of the environmental statutes are even, have gone on updated even longer than that. Now, this is extraordinary given the fact that environmental regulation is such a technologically based area where there are rapid changes in our understanding of what the problems are, rapid changes in our understanding of how to best solve the problems. Now, I wasn't the only one who understood that these statutes were obsolete and that their obsolescence was a problem for the public. Uh, Richard Stewart, former chair of the Environmental Defense Fund, former assistant attorney general for environment and natural resources in the first Bush administration, uh, professor at NYU School of Law. His colleague there, Katrina Weinman, and I began a project to try to suggest how these laws ought to be updated. And we brought together 50 environmental law experts on the right and the left, and we came together and what we told this team of experts was, we're not interested in discussing how clean is clean enough. That's a political question. We're not going to be able to really solve that one. But we could certainly show how to get more bang for the buck in environmental protection, how to get more environmental protection at a lower cost um, than the current statutes allow. And the upshot of this effort was we wrote a book called Breaking the Law Jam, uh, published by Yale Press, uh, that, that said how to do this. And the book jacket carries blurbs by the president of the Environmental Defense Fund, by uh, presidential appointees, uh, appointees of Republican and Democratic presidents, former heads of EPA, and so on, saying, these people have the right idea. This is a good thing to do. Okay? So Dick Stewart and I start going around the halls of Congress, and we're talking to Democrats, we're talking to Republicans, and they're all basically saying pretty much the same thing. Gosh, what you're suggesting makes all kinds of sense. 
I wish it was on the statute books, but you know, my colleagues here in Congress, they don't really want to take responsibility. And fixing these statutes is going to take some responsibility. They're not going to do it. And you know, they were absolutely right. There was one member of Congress who really tried to move forward, but he was like disappeared into the quicksand. And this experience really shook me because I was kind of in the mental habit of thinking is that by and large, Congress is moving towards some kind of conception of what's good for the constituents. But this was contrary to that, absolutely contrary. And the evidence began to pile up that this wasn't just a matter of environmental law. I mean, you think about the things that Congress can't do. I mean, adopt a budget, come to some kind of resolution of the health care problem that has widespread buy-in, fix the immigration statutes, or you know, come to some kind of resolution. All of this gets swallowed up in some kind of wild polarization that prevents Congress from doing its job, which is to come to compromise solutions on pressing national problems. And that's, and the public disdains Congress. Okay. So, many people are beginning to see this. The result of which is that a former dean of the Stanford Law School uh, um, became president of a foundation, somewhat on the left, the Hewlett Foundation, and began something called the Manasotian Initiative to try to do something about Congress. And the foundation gave grants to groups on the left and the right, including the Federalist Society. And with that money, um, the uh, Federalist Society began this, uh, this initiative called the Article One Initiative, um, so that it, along with other organizations, could try to find some solution to the sickness that we have in Congress. <coughs> and um, it so happened that while this was all beginning, I was beginning to write a book about what I'd seen, motivated by what I saw in the environmental area, but I wanted to make the book more widespread because <coughs> only so many people get excited about the environment, but I saw the same problem occurring all over the place. Taxing and spending, war, you name it. The same type of phenomena of, of members of Congress ducking responsibility was harming our government. So. I wrote this book here, recently published, called DC Confidential. And my effort was not to advance the agenda of the right or the left, but rather to fix the institution that comes to some kind of compromise solution about the problems of the left and the right. And that is symbolized on the book cover by the indication that forwards to this book have been written by or provided by Governor Howard Dean, former chair of the Democratic National Committee, and Senator Mike Lee, who's probably about as far on the right as anybody in the United States Senate. Okay, so what the book tries to explain why Washington today has become a place of many dramas and few decisions about pressing issues. And obviously this uproar and indecision hurt the nation, uh, and there's no doubt that this uh, drama is caused in part by the uh, personalities of some of the actors in Washington. But the thing is, what we need to keep our eyes on is our best hope of avoiding further repetition of such crises is to get to its root cause. And the root cause, I believe, what elected Donald Trump what got Bernie Sanders so much support in the Democratic primary, so this is not a left or a right thing, is the people have gotten to distrust our government. And the distrust and the fall in trust is absolutely phenomenal. I mean here's the here's the data. 64, 76 percent of the public answered affirmatively to the question, do you trust the federal government to do the right thing? all the time, or just about all the time, 76%. In 2015 and 2017, both before and after Trump's election, the figure was 19%. Now that's just an astounding change. Now, you also may be astounded at the idea that 
something like 76% of the public trusted the government in 1964. How can this be? I mean, but that's your vantage point. That's how you see the world today. It didn't seem that way to me back in the 60s. Here I am as an aide to vice, then Vice President Hubert Humphrey. When I first went to work in the Senate in 1962, I was proud to be there because I really felt these people in Congress were being responsive to their constituents. And, I, and as I worked on various pieces of legislation, I very much got the impression that the way the system worked was like this. That members of Congress took credit for conferring benefits. They were happy to do that. They weren't so happy to take the blame for the burdens that their legislation imposed, but they weren't ducking the blame by and large. And that's, of course, the way the system is supposed to work. That's how Article I is supposed to work. And the great thing about this setup is that it aligns the interests of the <coughs> members of Congress in getting reelected with the interests of their constituents in having a government that, by and large, serves their, their interests. Okay? But things began to change in the late 1960s. And the change was that they began to legislate in new ways that lets them shift the blame for the bad <coughs> stuff to other folks. Now, this blame shifting began innocently. It wasn't like a bunch of people in the Congress sat down and said, how could we avoid blame? It came from something else. Let me try to explain what was going on. Americans of the mid-1960s had seen their government work wonders. Think about what I, growing up, knew about my government, or thought I knew about our government. It got us through the Great Depression. It won World War II. It had invented atomic energy, which ended World War II, and promised cheap, clean electricity. It built the interstate highway system, which did not exist when Dick and I were children. It was now in charge of an economy that was the best in the world and rising. People felt confident about their economic futures. It had passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It promised to end poverty. I just went and visited the LBJ library and I saw one of the plaques there. It says, I'm quoting, the 1960s was a time of great optimism. And it was that optimism and the hubris that came with it that led to the problem. The people, understandably, wanted government, this wonder-working government, to do more. Like, for example, and this is only one of many examples, stop pollution. But voters also, understandably, I mean, we're all human, they didn't want to bear heavy burdens. Okay. So the legislators, again being human, wanted to satisfy the voters. Great. Okay. So they searched for ways to please them, please us. Okay. So take the Clean Air Act of 1970. It promised healthy air without great burdens. And there was a theory to support it. It was called technology forcing. This was the idea. We, the Congress would set a definite deadline for the air to be healthy and tell industry, if you don't, you're, you're going to have to clean up to that extent by the deadline, otherwise factories will have to shut. That was in the legislative history. The idea was that the Congress didn't want to shut factories. They figured they set the definite deadline, the industry could invent the ways to get it done in an affordable way. And the way Congress explained it to us was this. American ingenuity could put a man on the moon, just put a man on the moon, and if it could do that, it could clean the air on Earth. This, I swear, was what Congress said. This was said. The only problem was the theory didn't work. Turned out that to meet the health deadlines, 
by the deadline would have required taking something like two-thirds of the cars off the road in Southern California. Now, that just was not going to happen, right? And so the elected officials made quite clear to EPA, you're not going to do that. And they didn't. So there's all kinds of ways in which the politicians were basically telling the agency, don't do stuff that's going to upset our constituents. So to the extent, I'm probably, so they shifted land to the EPA, and that meant that instead of the interests of the legislators and the, and the constituents being in line, they were not now in conflict. Okay. Um, so once began, Congress began to shift land in this way, it was hard for them to go back. I mean, this is a great system for getting reelected, right? You make the rosy promises, you shift the blame for the disappointments and, for, and, and or for the burdens. Why not go with it? Right? It's like bad money drives out the good. It's true in the economy and it's true in legislation. Okay? So the interests of the legislators went from being aligned to those of their constituents to being in conflict. Now I saw the effects of this firsthand when I was an attorney for the Natural Resources Defense Council in the 1970s. I saw this in regard to many of my cases, but let me tell you about one of them. It was the, it were the cases to get lead out of gasoline. Now the statute said that the public's health would be protected from lead by the mid, and by about around 1976. That was the deadline. But to take the lead out of gasoline would somewhat increase the refining cost. That would be unpopular, you know, having to pay more at the pump. And so there was pressure on EPA from liberals and conservatives in Congress not to do it. Now, um, and I brought lawsuits and I won. Second Circuit, DC Circuit, <clears throat> Circuit denied in the Supreme Court. But it took a long time to get the process to work. And so health was not protected by the statutory deadline. Now, years later, I began to think to myself, as I began, it, it, the late 60s up the 70s, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't understand about the blame shifting. But when I began to do that, to understand the blame shifting, I thought to myself, what would have happened if Congress, what would have happened in 1970 if Congress couldn't have shifted blame? And what would have happened is they would have come to some kind of compromise, I believe. And I'm not going to go into all the details. I published the details of this in a book. Uh, couple of books, and they've been out for years, nobody's ever challenged what I'm saying. This is the bottom line. Is the lead wouldn't, the Congress would not have promised perfect health, but it would have reduced lead some. As a result, the lead would have come up somewhat faster, about a decade faster, and I've, I've used EPA's health data, we believe EPA's data on the health impacts of lead, the consequences of the delay from the rosy promises was about 50,000 people died. And several hundred thousand children had their IQs reduced below 70. These are my clients. 50,000 people are as many as Americans who died in the war in Vietnam. So this was a wake up call for me, and it began to change completely how I thought about law and how I thought about government. Okay, so to shift blame, members of Congress use tricks. I mean, the subtitle of my book is Inside the Five Tricks of Washington. Um, now, how can they get away with these tricks? Because we, you know, you look at a politician and the first thing that goes off in your mind is trickster, right? Well, but there's all kinds of folks we know that are tricksters that get away with tricks. Think about a stage magician that pulls a rabbit out of a hat. You know he's doing a trick, right? But it works. So why does it work? Because we don't see the slights of hand. So what I've tried to do in my book 
is to identify the sleights of hand that allow members of Congress to work the tricks. So let's start with the regulation trick, the one that's most pertinent to environmental law. Um, previously, what Congress had done is it either enacted the rules of conduct itself, which meant it, it took credit for the rights, the regulatory rights that it gave people and the duties that it imposed, and it took, took responsibility for the benefits and the burdens, or it handed the whole thing off to an agency saying, yeah, pollution is a problem, you solve it. And to the extent that it did the latter, it sort of handed it off to the agency and didn't meddle with the agency, the agencies had their internal reasons for wanting to reach a relatively balanced solution. But with the regulation trip, which I think really got off to a roaring start with the Clean Air Act in the 1970s, they did something different. They created judicially enforceable rights to regulatory protection. And then they commanded the agencies to impose the duties corresponding to the rights. And as you know from law school, there ain't really no right unless there's a duty. But they only took responsibility for the half of the deal, the rights, not the duties. So that meant the members of Congress got credit for the good stuff, protection, and shifted blame to the agency for the failures to deliver on the rights and on the burdens. That's the sleight of hand. Now, this trick harms us to this day. With it, members of Congress write the statutes to maximize the credit and minimize the blame, not to maximize the benefits to us and minimize the burdens on us. Let me give you an example. Now, we know that Congress gains by making commands. Command the agency to fulfill this right, right? By imposing duties. Well, the more commands, the better. If you take the words Administrator shall, and do a search of the Clean Air Act, I've done it, come up with 940 hits. 940 in one statute. And what's after the shall is generally pretty complicated, okay? And so that means the agency has to impose pretty complicated stuff. Now this is what Gina McCarthy, Barack Obama's EPA administrator, said about the result of the Clean Air Act. Quote, each sector has 17 to 20 rules that govern each piece of equipment, and you've got to be a neuroscientist to figure it out. End quote. So when I tell you these statutes are obsolete, it's because you've got so many commands, so much complication in a world that is rapidly changing. What we got here is a form of insanity. Really and truly. So we got these obsolete statutes, but the situation as it stands is great for members of Congress. I mean, think about the opportunities that it allows them. Some, some members of Congress could say, I'm against pollution killing children, right? You've heard that one. And you got other members of Congress saying, I'm against regulation killing jobs, right? Notice they never have to deal with the trade-offs that are inevitable between the two. Now they say in the statute, protect health, but they knew when they passed the statute there was no feasible level of pollution that actually was protecting health. But they couldn't get away with their trick if they said, reduce the health effects. That doesn't sound like a promise you could get much credit for. So they pretended that there was a safe level that was achievable, which require, has required EPA under every presidential administration to lie, to say, oh, we didn't consider a cost when we set the ambient air quality. And I have you know, Cass Sunstein, Boyd and Gray, all kinds of people acknowledge that this is fraud. I know they don't use that word, but they're lying. Deceitful. So, we end up with a form of regulatory schizophrenia in polarization. 
you wonder why government has become so polarized? Well, this is part of it. Now, another trick is the money trick. And by the way, I mean, I guess I said already, but I'll say it again. The reason why I wanted to get the tricks other than the regulation trick is I think when you see that the same pattern of behavior is repeated again and again, you begin to see the problem not so much as a problem of bad policy results in some one area, like clean air, but you see it as a problem of dishonesty in Washington. And I think to the extent we could begin to see the problem that way, there's a better chance of getting the political horsepower needed to, to fix the problem. Now, the money trick too began, innocently enough, around in the later 1960s. Now, Congress previously had generally raised the revenues needed to pay for the benefits it promised, which gave its members credit for the benefits and length of burdens. Now, I understand that occasionally there were big deficit deficits, but this was generally during wars or big depressions, and often these big budget deficits were followed by some years where they ran surplus. So it wasn't like everything was always balanced completely down to the last penny, but by and large Congress was taking blame for the burdens needed to fulfill its promises. I mean, for example, Social Security, as enacted in 1935, they imposed, Congress and FDR imposed taxes fully sufficient to pay for the benefits that they promised as they understood them in 1935. And what, when you come to Medicare, Lyndon Johnson, 1965, ah, uh -uh, they didn't do that. What they were doing is shifting forward in time to need to impose the taxes needed to pay for what they had just promised. <coughs> So what the money trick has our members of Congress doing is shifting blame to the future, to future legislators, to future presidents for the need to increase taxes or cut spending in order to make ends meet. And the parlance for this in Washington is kicking the can down the road. Now, I, I want to be clear here that the problem is not that we have a debt. The problem is not that we have a current debt. We could live with the debt as large as we have right now, ad infinitum. The problem is that we have current policies that are going to cause the debt to national income ratio to keep going up and up and up. Now, there's no certainty as to how high it could go, but we know it can't go up forever. Because at some point, people who led the government with money are going to say, I'm not going to get paid. So that's just the truth. So in my book, I try to make some calculations based on the work of workers from economists I trust as to how much it would cost to make things, make ends meet. Now, I'm going to, now let me give you a sort of a, a way of thinking about this. Is you got to either you got to change current policies to cut spending that would take place under current policies, or increase taxes that would be imposed under current policies. Now, in the end, those spending cuts or tax increases get felt by individuals. If you cut federal aid to the University of Texas, in the end it's going to be felt by students or faculty or somebody, custodians or somebody. So this is the calculation, I'm going to, this is the bottom line of the calculation I did. This was as of 2012. The cost per family, average family of four, of making ends meet $17,998. I mean, it's an estimate, but that's what the, the calculation came out to. Per year, it's a huge amount of money. It just sort of boggles my mind it could be that much. Yeah. 
And the longer you delay, the higher the price tag. So since it's now five years after 2012, it will be somewhat greater than that. One reason I think the sum is so large is given current policies and given demographics of new retirees and the number of workers, it gets, the picture gets worse and worse and worse, particularly under Medicare. So how do they get away with this? Because, I mean, we all hear about burdens on future generations. And that's you, by the way. How do they get away with it? Well, the way they get away with it is this, is they make the promises of benefits very concrete. People get a letter every year saying, this is how much your Social Security payment is going to be when you retire at such and such a date, down to the dollar, right? You don't get a letter saying, this is how much taxes on your family or spending cuts to you know, pay for benefits for your family are going to have to go down. So they, you know, just like the magician makes you kind of look at the rabbit and not where it's coming from, Congress is kind of hiding from you what it doesn't want you to see by, by, by keeping the and because, what they do report is the national debt, you know, 20 trillion. Well, that doesn't mean any more to me in terms of what it means for my life than the distance to the moon. You've got to make it concrete to have any real political sense. Next trick, the federal mandate trick. Now, Congress previously had required states to honor constitutional rights, as it darn well should, and to, when Congress gave money to a state to build a highway or to do something else, it, it, it properly required the state to do it right. It would be stupid to give money to states to build highways and then have them build highways with crummy concrete. So you're going you're to make a condition on the grant that you've got to use decent material. Okay? With the federal mandate trick, and, but, but notice here that this does not involve shifting a blank. Congress gets some credit for giving a grant to uh, the states for the highways, but they have to pay for the grant. With the federal mandate trick, however, members of Congress found a, a way to get the credit for the good stuff and avoid the blame, which is basically to tell the states to do something which people would like, but have them take the blame for the states, take the blame for the burdens. So, so for example, Clean Air Act, let me use that as an example again. It says to the states, well, if you want your federal highway grants, you're also going to have to do what we say in terms of cleaning up the air. You, you the states, you, the governors, you, the legislators, are going to have to impose the burdens on your local industry to make the air as clean as we promised the voters it was going to be made. Okay. This is what they call cooperative federalism. This is how cooperative federalism works. Congress gets credit for promising clean air and makes the governors and the state legislators take a lot of the blame for imposing the burden they didn't deliver. That's cooperative federalism. Didn't that come from the Johnson era as well, now that I think about it? Okay. So basically what's going on here is Congress is inviting the states out to dinner and has leaves them with the tag. So where is the, what's the sleight of hand here? How does it work? The governor must go along <coughs> with these mandates because it's political suicide for a governor to turn down the federal highway grant. I mean, after all, where did the money come from? From the governor's own constituents. It's going to be stupid for citizens of Texas to pay taxes for there to be federal highway grants and have all the money go to other states. So you may ask yourself the question, why aren't members of Congress shaking in their boots because they're going to be blamed for this mandate on the state? The answer is, members of Congress are smart enough never to leave fingerprints on the mandate. There have been many dozens of roll call votes on the Clean Air Act, but never a roll call vote on any of these mandates on the Clean Air Act. So members of Congress say, well, 
I wouldn't have supported that, but I did want to vote for clean air. I voted for the Clean Air Act, that's fine, but I didn't vote for that mandate. That's the federal mandate trick. And, and this trick harms us too, because it drives states to spend more and do more, even though they are facing looming fiscal crisis, and even though as the federal government runs into increasing financial difficulty, it's going to probably have to begin to cut back on grants to the states. The debt guarantee trick. Now, previously, previously to the 1960s, Congress had guaranteed the payment of some private debts. For example, during the Great Depression, when there was a banking panic, the Congress set up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation to guarantee that banks would make good on small deposits. Initially, the limit was $2,500. Now, quite purposefully, they did not guarantee repayment of the banks to the big depositors or to the people who bought the bonds of the bank. And here's why. So long as the bigger, more sophisticated depositors and the bondholders were also more sophisticated, didn't have the repayment of the money that was owed them guaranteed, they would stop depositing money and lending money to banks that were engaging in speculative practices. <coughs> because they may not get paid back. So that imposed a kind of marketplace discipline on the banks. But again, in 1968, under Lyndon Johnson, the federal government began to guarantee the debts of some of the financial giants, which meant they could begin to engage in speculative lending practices, which would pay them higher interest and drive up their profits in good time, without having to pay more interest on their debt and, still, and indeed still have access to the capital market to borrow more money. So it encouraged them to, um, I can't think of the word for when you borrow, leverage. It encouraged them to leverage their capital and to engage in more speculative lending. But when bad times came, as they came in 2007, through a bubble that was financial bubble that was caused in part by these uh, debt guarantees, then taxpayers were the ones who had to bail out the financial Wall Street. Now, voters got very upset about this. And the upshot was that Congress passed a statute that purported to end this practice, the Dodd-Frank Act. It does not end the practice. It's still there and just hidden. So the debt guarantee trick continues. So the harm that could come from us, come to us from these big banks failing is still there. Meanwhile, we got President Trump, the great swamp runner, is talking about easing the regulation of the banks, but he's not talking at all about any of the debt guarantee trick. I call him the swamp runner in chief. Okay, last trick, the war trip. During the nation's first 160 years, um, Congress did take responsibility for going to war, either by declaring war or by passing a statute that specifically authorized the war to take place. That changed with Korea in 1950. President Truman said, I don't need to go to Congress, this is just the police action. 33,000 American troops died in the first action. People got upset about this, and as a consequence, in 1973, Congress passed something called the War Powers Resolution, which purported to say that presidents can't go to war without going to Congress first and getting approval. But Congress and the presidents together used a loophole in the War Powers Act such that if the war is controversial, the 
president doesn't go to Congress, which is great for the president because the president gets more leeway to do what the president wants. And it's great for Congress because if the war turns out to be popular, the members of Congress can march on the victory parade. And if it proves unpopular, they can shift all the blame to that guy in the White House. So for example, with Libya, Republicans and Democrats in Congress went to Obama and said, you should intervene, you should kill that Qaddafi. And by the way, don't make us vote on it. So the tricks harm us too because our troops are put into combat subject to enemy fire while in the home front, Congress and the President are shooting at each other. And the President has, of course, been on the tricks too. Uh, the President gains power from the war power tricks. With the other trick, the President, like members of Congress, gets to make rosy promises in signing the legislation. Have a nice ceremony in the White House. I'm doing great things for you, public. But blame goes elsewhere. So what do we do about this? I'm going to try to wind up in five minutes. Uh, my advice is don't hate the player, hate the game. In other words, we need to change the ground rules of the game of politics in Washington this play today. You can't hate the player, or you can't hate the player, but it doesn't do much good because legislators are afraid that if they or their party give up the tricks, and the other party gets elected. So even if you manage to mount a campaign to stop the re-election of your representative, whoever gets elected in that person's place, their tendency is going to be to keep on playing the tricks. Just like Donald Trump is continuing all the same tricks that came before. So what you've got to do is change the ground rules of the games of politics so that all players have to behave more honestly. And that would return the power to the people if it should. Now, my contention is that Congress could change the ground rules through statute. We don't have to have a constitutional convention. I don't think we're going to get a constitutional convention or a constitutional amendment. I think things like the balanced budget amendment, you heard of that one? That's just a way for members of Congress to pose that they want to be responsible about the budget and then cut taxes too, right? or raise spending. Because they know it's not going to happen, so that, that's a way they can appeal to people who are concerned about money without actually having to do anything that's not popular. So what to do about the money trick? Well, you, if you heard of the Truth in Lending Act, that says that nobody can lend you money unless they give you a piece of writing that tells you, tells you how much you have to pay. Well, let's say we apply that same principle to Congress in something I call the Honest Deal Act, where Congress has to tell you how much you're going to have to pay to allow government to make ends meet over the long run. And in particular, about that $17,000, and how much greater it was made, that debt was made by the last Congress, and how much greater it's going to be if they keep the light. That's the equivalent, and that would be truth in spending. They could do that. Okay. Uh, what about the regulation trick? What can you do to end that? <coughs> and by the way, my truth in, in spending doesn't dictate that we eliminate the debt, it doesn't dictate that we have a balanced budget, it just says members of Congress need to be accountable for what they're doing on the taxing and spending. Regulation. So re recall its basic structure. Regulation. <coughs> Congress creates a regulatory, you know, creates regulatory statutes where they take credit and shift blame. Okay. Now, because of perceptions of this, back in 1995, I think somebody else this close. Okay. Some Democrats and Republicans in Congress came to me and said, "What can we do about this?" So. What I thought about was a proposal that James Landis 
the New Deal's guru of administrative law, made in a book published in 1938, where he said the major regulatory decisions of the agency should be put to a roll call vote in Congress. And he said this would mean that the agency would be the technical agent in the initiation of the rules of conduct, I'm quoting him, yet at the same time make elected alleged lawmakers share in the responsibility for its adoption. So I took this idea and I merged it with a law review article written by Stephen Breyer, then a judge, about how you could take the Landis idea and implement it in a perfectly constitutional and workable way. And the result was the statute called the Congressional Responsibility Act, introduced first in 1995. Congressional Responsibility Act. It got some attention and some support. It would begin to go somewhere in Congress. I was very pleased. Problem was that the Republicans who then controlled Congress didn't want to be accountable, even if the Democrats were accountable. So it came up with a variation on the statute called the Congressional Review Act. You've heard of that. Whereas the Congressional Responsibility Act would have required members of Congress to be responsible, the Congressional Review Act gives them the option to be. And go, now how often do you think they want to be responsible? Not very. So we got something that doesn't work. Now, but think about what the world would have been like if the Congressional Responsibility Act had been passed. Think about air pollution, for example. They wouldn't be voting on whether you want to protect health or whether you want to cut costs. They would be voting on specific proposals. Do you want to cut this kind of pollution from this source this much? That means you're responsible for the benefits of the pollution reduction and the burdens. Now, all of a sudden, that gives you an incentive to want to, that responsibility gives members of Congress an incentive to want to figure out how to get more bang for the buck, how to regulate more efficiency efficiently, which means you want to fix the absolute statutes. You want to fix the absolute. So in other words, the fact that they're not responsible for the stuff they can blame the agencies for is why they don't update these stupidly obsolete statutes. Okay, so fast forward. The Congressional Review Act doesn't do a darn thing, so the Republicans are still angry about regulatory costs, so they introduced a new statute called Regulations from the Executive in Need of Scrutiny. Now, it's kind of like the Congressional Responsibility Act in that it would require votes, but notice, first of all, the optics of it. They're blaming the agencies for the mess that Congress created. They are positioning themselves as not pro-responsibility, but anti-regulatory. And the substance of this, and, and added on to the Landis-Breyer ideas, is a bunch of garbage that would, is designed to make sure the thing never gets passed. Now, they could go back to the original Landis kind of idea. The Republicans could introduce such a bill. The Democrats could introduce such a bill. But you know what? The present setup is just perfect for both sides. They could both complain about what they want to complain about and be responsible for nothing. Now, I am talking to a few senators on both sides of the aisle. I think there's a possibility I could get some, something introduced that would get back to the Landis prior idea, but I don't know. Okay, so just another slide or two and we're about done here. So I want to call your attention to my website for the book. If you look on the upper left-hand corner of the five tricks, that's a brief summary of the tricks. The next one over, how to get an honest deal, that's a summary of my Honest Deal Act proposal. The next one over, take action, that explains how you could um, write to your members of Congress and get them to do it. Take just a few minutes to do it. And you know who's really particularly behind this abomination of the regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny? Lamar Smith. Represents the district just down the road, right? Any, any constituents on Lamar Smith here? 
Well, you wouldn't know anyway, so just write it and tell them to get off the duff, okay? And then finally, all the way on the right there, games. We got some online games that will show much more graphically than I can do in a talk just how these tricks work and how they can be fixed. And if you want an easy view of the website for the book, there, there's the website. website. So if I've convinced you at all, please do a little something, because I don't think it takes that many of us to begin to move this awful thing we have in Washington. Because, you know, I've known a lot of these legislators down through the years. By and large, they went into public service because they wanted to do some public good. They wake up every morning, they look in the mirror, and they say to themselves, I'm going to work in the most despised institution in America. That doesn't feel good. Many of them would really want to change, and if really not such a large number of people tell them, we see what's going on, we want to work with you on this, I think there's a possibility of getting somewhere. Thank you very much. Let's talk a little bit. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. Do you know if this is just a U.S. phenomenon, or is there also a comparison able to other international countries? Because I feel like this would not be only U.S. related. Well, I, I'm, I don't, I guess the simple answer is I don't know, but a couple things come to mind. Is that belief in democracy in developed countries, the polls show, is going, going down across the developed world. Now, I would imagine and at least some of the tricks are, are being replicated in other countries because you know the, the, the business of debt to national income is going up in other places. Uh, it's harder to imagine exactly how the regulation trick would work in other places because with the parliamentary system there is not as much separation between the legislative body and, and the um, the regulars, but I may be wrong about that. But anyway, I don't. I don't have a very specific. I can't say more than that. Yes. Uh, I was surprised to not see gerrymandering as one of the tricks that you listed, and I was wondering if you think that gerrymandering is at least partially responsible for the increased polarization in Congress. Good question. Uh, in earlier drafts of the book, I did have some material on gerrymandering. And I mean, of course, gerrymandering is an abomination because it lets the representatives pick their, their constituents instead of the other way around. There is some political science that tends to suggest that gerrymandering doesn't contribute that much to polarization because after all, says the political science, the Senate is pretty darn polarized too, and gerrymandering doesn't figure in the Senate. Um, but I can imagine a way in which the change dialogue in the House infects the politics of the Senate. And in any event, um, I dropped gerrymandering from the book for a very instrumental kind of reason, which is I really couldn't figure out a credible solution to the gerrymandering problem, at least as long as we had the, Civil, uh, the Voting Rights Act. Because the Voting Rights Act really calls for a formal result-oriented districting. We, we have a way of putting it. So, I do talk about gerrymandering in the book, and I find it awful, but I, I, don't, ha I don't list it as one of the five tricks. And um, if, when we think, if, if we think the, the ultimate harm is polarization, gerrymandering ought to be, it ought to be solved anyway, and, and it's a cause of, of the, uh, at least it's, it's likely cause of some of the polarization. But if we're talking about flight from responsibility, I don't think gerrymandering is part of that. Good question. And, and I have a similar answer as the fundraising, you know, as the campaign contributions. Is, um, actually, a long time, I don't know, I'll, I'll say something about it. That we've been trying for years to do something about the effect, you know, about big money and the effect of big money. Uh, and it's, it's hard to see our, I mean, I'm all for getting something done about it. I don't know what to do about it. And I see a lot of barriers and, and problems. But I think stopping the tricks would be so important to stopping the infectious impact of big money for this reason. The tricks are a way in which a member of Congress could take the money 
gratify the campaign contributor, be it a corporation or a union, and avoid blame for the harm to the public, they're gratifying that campaign contributor uh, would require. So I think the tricks allow money to bubble out. And once money doesn't buy as much, it may be easier to solve the money problem. It's a kind of demand side response to campaign contributions. Yes, sir. Uh, you talked about the, um, the the percentage of people that are confident in government. You mentioned the statistics from '64 and 2015. Do you have a sense of how that statistic dropped over time or changed? Yes, it was a fairly rapid drop uh, through the '70s, and you could attribute a lot of that to Watergate and the Vietnam War. But if that's the only thing that was going on, then you would expect the confidence to be back up higher today. But it didn't follow a, a, a even line that kind of went up and it went, it went down in the 70s, went up a little bit in the early 80s, and then went down again. If you want to see the data, just go to Pew Research and look for distrust. And you'll see a graph there that lays it all out. So anyway, I mean, I think the reason it's so much lower today is not Vietnam or Watergate. It's what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Do you imagine, or I'll say, passing what you did in the past, had that not happened, uh, and you were to try to pass that today, do you think that would be uh, more difficult? Guess what? Well, you we were involved in the efforts of the moving lead from gasoline. Would it be more difficult today? today um, no, I think it would be easier today because the, the science has become more defined about the health effects of lead. Um, when you think about the uproar about Flint, Flint, the crisis in Flint came because something like 4% of the children in Flint had lead above the level we presently say is poison, unacceptable. 4% of the children. That's the tragedy, right? In New York City in the 70s, the average child had blood lead levels four times that. I mean, that just makes sense of children in their body. Um, and so it would be much easier today to do something about it. Yeah. Follow-up question. Um, when you're mentioning these statistics... But I'll say something else about that. Yeah. The Clean Air, there was one place in the Clean Air Act, 70, where Congress did take responsibility. That was new cars. It said, didn't say, we're going to make new cars such, they'll never, such as they'll never hurt health. They're saying, we're, they said, we're going to cut the, the emissions from new cars by 90% over the next five years. If they had just been cut, the, cut the emissions of lead by 50% over the next five years, we have been miles ahead of where we got. And the more, and the Detroit was a much more powerful force than, than the makers of lead additives. Anyway, we could anyway today we could do much better on lead if we had the lead. Yes, sir. Were you involved in replacing, I'll say, lead and gasoline to move into ethanol? As like a ethanol is not a replacement for lead. You didn't have to put ethanol in. The reason we got the ethanol is it's good for the corn farmers. Right, yeah, exactly. And the environmental groups supported it, right, initially. But now many, a number of the environmental groups understand that it doesn't do very much good for climate change and there's a lot of, there's impact on species and stuff like that. So it's, whether there's an environmental benefit of the ethanol, it's much more questionable, but the reason we got it is Archer Daniel Middle, Midlands and Corn Farmers. What well, would you say the evolution is? Like, what? the next thing, replacing ethanol from it, like, remove ethanol, or remove lead, like, it's got to be a removal of ethanol. No, you don't, you could, you, could, you could just take the lead out of gas, and you don't need the ethanol. The, the ethanol, the lead, the removal of lead is not why we have ethanol. In fact, ethanol, 
Listen, I don't. I, I avoid putting ethanol or gasoline into my chainsaw because I know it's bad for the motor. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and there was some some theory that lead was necessary for motors, not so. Yes. So if we're gonna if we're gonna make Congress take responsibility for policies instead of passing the buck to sure. executive agencies, it seems like the the way that the administrative state works is gonna have to shift. But it's but I, I feel like people actually like the administrative state. Like they like that we have all these experts and executive agencies and then we can't do but then you can't have like a legislative veto or anything like that to have Congress take a little responsibility for what's going on in the agency. So I'm just wondering if there's going to need to be like some jurisprudential change. I, I mean, no, I don't think anybody wants non-delegation, like not to be, for Congress not to be able to delegate their powers at all. But I was just wondering what you think that looks like. Okay. Well, first of all, as a matter of history, Landis said we need to have Congress take responsibility. There's two ways of doing it: the legislative veto or having them vote on the, to approve or disapprove the major decision. And Congress went for the <coughs> veto, but as you know, in the China case, struck it down. The Breyer article was saying, well, if Congress wants to be responsible, there's another way of doing it. And basically what he was talking about was Landis's other alternative. Now, with Landis's other alternative, um, the the experts, as Landis says, you know, the experts would still be the initiator, but Congress would have to take responsibility. So what would likely happen would be that the agency, before it comes up with its final rule, would, um, would begin to have a conversation with the swing vote in Congress as to how to write the what it would promulgate in a way that's more likely to pass. And that's how it should be, right? Do you think that it's likely that that would be challenged? I mean, of course, that would be challenged. Well, Breyer, Breyer thought that, you know, the problems that, that the court saw in Chatham, Breyer did not see in this alternative. Because that will be, we'd be following the basic Article I legislative process. Both houses and the president have to sign off. And in the Breyer's, in the Breyer's formulation, it's not just the Congress would have to vote affirmatively on the regulation. <coughs> it would be presented to the president. The president could veto. Now, the point is that uh, given that it was his agency or her agency that came up with the rules, it's unlikely that there would be a veto. But the problem that the court saw in China was a formalistic problem. And He'd be taking his, he'd show how to meet that formalistic objection. More questions or comments? I think we need Yeah, how do I wrap up? Do you have to? Yeah. Do <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you very much. It was very thoughtful comments. I appreciate you talking to you. I like your spirit. And um, thank you very much. It was fun to have the afternoon to be here. Thank you.